Long before Mahoning became a county in 1846 and Youngstown became a village in 1848, and even before the city of Youngstown was chartered in 1867, you had African Americans who made their way into the valley via the Underground Railroad. There were numerous routes which wound their way in and near the area from Salem, East Liverpool, and even Western Pennsylvania as runaways moved further north with the aid of conductors and other helpers towards freedom. So immediately after the Civil War, the Youngstown area begins to receive an influx of new African-American residents, more from the Carolinas, Virginia, and Maryland. The abundance of coal, iron ore, which eventually led to the development of steel, helped the region grow, and that helped attract people of all races to the valley as well. In Youngstown, the colored AME church, currently known as St. Andrews, began in 1869 and included many of the early black families. The first meetings were in the home of Civil War veteran and pioneer resident Oscar D. Bogus. There were also some black Baptists in the area around that same time who were unorganized. Right around 1871, research dug up by Ben Larisha and Joe Tugaron for their book, Coal War in the Mahoney Valley, found ads in Virginia newspapers promising newly freed blacks from mining areas of Virginia employment, gardens, and housing in the valley. What they did not tell them was that they would be hired as black legs or strike breakers. In the 1920s in Youngstown, you saw the rise of the Klan with their anti-black, anti-Italian, anti-immigrant sentiments which impacted the lives of blacks in varying degrees. One of Youngstown's prominent businessmen, F.F. F. Armstrong, operated his haberdashery at 424 West Federal Street, near where the main fire station now stands. Called from interviews and also his son's writings, the late Dr. Herbert Armstrong, he recalls that the shop, quote, became a particular target of the Klan being the first black-owned business of its type in the city. The increased activity and presence eventually ran patrons away, forcing the building to close in 1926. As African Americans started making their way into politics and business in the city, there was still that reminder that no matter what strides you made, you would always encounter resistance. Even though Youngstown was north of the Mason-Dixon line, there were reminders here and in other northern cities that were invisible lines you simply could not cross. I remember my mother and others, elders, saying that they could only sit in the balconies in some of the movie halls after entering a building through a separate door, and that's here in this area, or attend certain schools when they were growing up here. Nathaniel Lee, seen here in a photo with one of the Dunbar Corral groups, also led the NAACP. It was his efforts and those of others seeking to integrate local swimming pools in the area that led to news stories that were picked up by media across the country. The effort on June 23, 1949 to integrate the Lincoln Park swimming pool forced the closing of the pool after Lee was told to take his children and leave the pool or watch his children drown. He fought racial inequality on several fronts, which included employment and law enforcement. The practice of redlining in the city was something black families looking to move into certain areas of the city were confronted with on a regular basis. It wasn't until 1968 that the Fair Housing Act was passed to fight that practice. But many of us know it continued long after that in one form or another. Then you had the impact of urban renewal, which often wiped out many minority communities. In closing, I think it's human nature to look for something better, to strive to carve out a place for yourself and your family with the goal of succeeding. We hope that through our labors, we leave something for our children to build upon although with many families struggling to find enough extra income to set aside to have a nest egg to fall back on, it's become exceedingly difficult for many of our brothers and sisters to make ends meet, 
let alone store something away. It's ironic that when this was recorded, the COVID-19 pandemic was underscoring the socioeconomic disparities, not only here, but across the country. For over a century, Farmers National Bank has stood strong. Through booms and busts, peaks and valleys, we've learned to know the seasons and how to grow in each of them. During challenging times, everyone is reminded of the value of solid relationships in both life and business. Farmers, stand strong.